What's up, everybody? In the 1860s, Lincoln gave an address where he just casually mentions the extinct race of giants that used to live in America because everybody in America knew about the mound-building giants because the mounds were everywhere. But that completely got erased from our history, and now you're just a crazy person if you believe that there were actual giants. I recently did a video about the Naraji culture that built all of these hilltop fortresses, basically. And it turns out, this is on the island of Sardinia, it turns out that still to this day, everybody knows about the giants. There's the Tomb of the Giants and all kinds of stuff. And then on Malta, another Mediterranean island out there, the Hypogeum is just steeped in giant lore. And they say that giants built it. And all the way up until the 1950s, they say that a tour went down there and actually ran into giants that still live underground. So to me, it's not even a question of if they exist. It's a question of why did they cover this up? So let's start out in America with the ancient mound builders. And I'm going to show you what happened to them. There was no doubt in anyone's mind that the Native Americans that the first European settlers met, like the Cherokee and Creek and Seminoles, which is a possible lost tribe of Semites, didn't build these mounds because they told the Europeans, no, these were here long before our people. There were thousands of these, and as you can see, they dug every one of them up except for a limited few for posterity, I guess, like Cahokia Mound. But even where I grew up in the Ozarks, I remember farmers back in the day talking about Indian burial mounds being on their farms. I was watching a couple videos by Old World Florida yesterday, and he's showing examples of these huge mooring stones. And then there's things like the Bimini Road, and it seems pretty undeniable that there was an ancient seafaring culture that used to live in the southeast United States. And I hope the audio isn't too bad on this. It's raining abnormally hard for August, the hottest, driest month of the year. But he shows this newspaper from 1948 and an article entitled, Evidence of Ancient Florida Culture Indicated in Relics. The races who long antedated the Indians known to modern historians, so historians still acknowledge this in 1948, great cement cisterns for the storage of rainwater, canal systems, stone foundations for structures, and he tells of the exhumation of skeletal evidence of men who must have been at least seven feet tall. The Indians built few, if any, of these mounds. They were too indolent, and the Aborigines were a race of people called the Abenakis or probably the Abenakis, because they still acknowledge the existence of the Abenaki. But they say this was an Algonquin-speaking tribe in the Northeast. Their name translates to Children of the Sun, and they say that they could possibly be descendants of the Aztecs in Mexico. And I don't want to go too far off in the weeds here, but these similarities have been known for a long time. And there's all kinds of proofs of very extensive trade routes in ancient America, uh, you know, across all the Americas. But this site used to be known as Toltec Mounds. You still see right up there where it says Toltec Plantation. And when I looked it up, it said Plum Bayou. And I'm going, Plum Bayou, what? Sure enough, it was officially renamed in November of 2022. So to this day, they're still slowly phasing out what people knew to be fact just 50 years ago. And in this newspaper, he said the Children of the Sun inhabited these regions about six centuries ago. Well, six centuries prior to 1948 puts you right at 1348. And I've got evidence of cultures on basically every continent collapsing around this time. And I'm redoing this video, by the way, just because I'm just finally getting to where I can make a decent video. These events were so big that they couldn't erase it from the cultural memory. You can't cover up when a large percentage of the population gets wiped out. So in the centuries following that event, the Holy Roman Empire has created and maintained the narrative that, oh, it was just a contagion outbreak. But historians know good and well that in this general time period, I'm sure the dating's been messed with a little here, it started raining in Europe and it did not stop. They refer to this as the Great Famine. 
harvests were ruined for two years in a row and it rained so hard it washed away the topsoil. Okay, so what was happening in North America at that time? Climatic and ecological instability in the southeastern United States between AD 13 and 1400 have been cited for the possible cause for soil depletion. This is just one of all kinds of problems people were having at this time. I'm not going to get into it right now. But, you know, I'm just an independent researcher that came across all this stuff, and it paints a very clear picture. So I am sure that there have been plenty of actual historians that know this that have been silenced on this subject. There was a major shift about 700 years ago that devastated the mound-building culture. The natives still remembered this and told the new Europeans when they came over about it, and it's all been quietly erased. Why would you go through all the trouble of making this go away? So what? People used to be tall. All right, up next, we're back on the island of Sardinia. I just did a video on how there's 7,000 of these mountaintop fortresses, and I keep learning more about it. There used to be 30,000. And if you look up the giants of Sardinia, they're just going to lead you to these stone statues, but there's a lot more to the story. This is known as the Tomb of the Giants, and you see that little doorway. We'll get to that in a minute. And there are several of these with almost the exact same headstone but and the little door at the bottom, but these are actually different places. Notice how the rock to the right is a half circle. This is a different place, but, I mean, those headstones are almost identical. Then in the background, you see a pretty long stack of stones there. And then this one looks like a good 20-foot grave or so, you know. And people grew up around this stuff. So author Luigi Mucus writes that the people of the island have known about the presence of giants for generations. It's nearly impossible not to be aware of this history simply because bones have been found all over the island by locals going about their lives. Some say these belong to men 4 meters, 12 feet tall. Lucas himself found the remains of a giant skeleton in a cave in 1972, and many locals explain that the skeletons were shown to the authorities or experts and almost always disappeared into thin air the next day. I'm sure I will forget to put this in the link, so feel free to remind me if you're into this kind of thing. These two have been to Sardinia multiple times and theorized that the Canaanites fled to Malta in the Bible days and brought Nephilim in tow. They say there's even an inscription that mentions Joshua the robber, which would be Joshua of the Israelites who attacked and took their land. The Old Testament didn't work out very well for anybody that wasn't the Israelites. <laughs> but the guy on the right had an interesting theory about these little doorways. He said it was just big enough that his five-year-old son could crawl through there. And he said that there's little sitting benches and areas inside there. And it used to be walled off all the way around. So he theorized that adolescents would go in and commune with the ancestral giants as a rite of passage, coming of age ceremony. And from everything I've heard about it, the giants used to be very venerated by almost all the cultures. And at one time lived among humans in society. But it seems like the last surviving ones weren't very nice to mankind, like the red-headed giants of the Southwest. There's a lot of Native American tales where they would eat people. And, well, speaking of that, I guess that's a good segue over to Malta, where one Father Magre recorded 62 folk tales with names such as the giant and the bird hunter, a girl kills a female giant, a young boy kills nine giants, and the giant's bastions where the overall goal in each one of those is to not be eaten by giants. I'm pretty sure the whole island of Malta is just a bunch of huge megalithic cyclopean stones stacked up out in the middle of the ocean. Okay, I'm being sarcastic, but there's a lot of megaliths on Malta. They have cute little stories like how ancient Malta flourished in aridity. Talking about the dry desert conditions that are there modern day. But how about this? How about because it wasn't always dry why life flourished on the island. In a recent vid, I showed an account 
that said Cyprus, a couple islands over, was a lush, fertile, blooming island up until the 1300s and then became a desert island. But all of these so-called primitive indigenous cultures knew their own histories and left it in tales like this. One season, there was a terrible drought and all the beans withered on their stalks. And because Sansuna could no longer eat the broad beans, she died. Now, Sansuna is the legendary giantess that locals say built a lot of these megaliths. So there's a couple stories of what happened to her. Another story says, and I'm doing the quick version, one afternoon while she was carrying stones and had left the children alone, that's when the pirates came. When Sansuna saw that the children were missing, she knew exactly what happened, ran to the seashore, dove in, swam out there, caught up to the boat. The pirates started hacking at her hands, cut them off, and she fell backwards and drowned. Now, one of these stories is meant to put a healthy dose of fear into children about what bad men and ships will do. And if they get you on a ship, not even a giantess can save you. Where the other one says, hey, there comes a time when it may not rain for seven years and you better be stocked up. You heard what happened to the giantess. And there's probably all these weird details that make no sense to us, but describe astrological events. Like the Aztec moon goddess Coil Shakwe and her 400 brothers. Well, the 400 brothers are the southern stars. You should check out Mr. Mythos in Earth Theories number 7 about the House Lafini Hypogeum. He's way more professional than I am. Much better video. <laughs> uh, there have been elongated skulls found there. And people have noticed in recent decades much of the bones have disappeared. Because everywhere you go looking for this evidence, it's all disappeared. So why and by who? Who would stand to gain or lose from this? Some of these also have some strange features that would fit right into an ancient Greek drama. Like inside there's a mysterious pit. The low stone wall is grooved to receive an upper stone, thus increasing its height. The pit is shaped like a funnel. And after sloping downward and inward, the pit widens considerably and is sufficiently deep to prevent even a tall man from climbing out. Another interesting feature that researchers found by accident, the hard way, just a ways inside the cave after it gets dark to where you can't see anything, then there's a big drop-off in the staircase. And one of the researchers broke a femur there. In the ancient world, when you came across a bunch of hooded people on a strange island, it probably wasn't a good idea to follow them into the caves because you never knew who they were worshiping. You've probably heard of how ancients would offer their young to the god Moloch, something that's still done on a national level. But stories like this involve kind of an abstract concept of a god. But what if they were much more flesh and bone and right down the street in a cave? Well, this is basically what is claimed to have happened to one Lois Jessup in the 1930s. And I'm going to qualify her first here a little bit because this is a pretty extraordinary story. But a New York Magazine editor wrote that we spent two days with Lois Jessup during our Eastern trip in April 1960 and found her a charming hostess, cosmetologist cosmopolitan as a much-traveled English woman can be, and a student of the borderland. Lois has a level-headed, level-eyed way of looking at life and people, which is very refreshing. Nevertheless, I found her Malta story difficult to believe until Miss Crabb and I returned home, and I had a chance to look up Malta at the San Diego Library. Long story short, he did confirm that the details that she gave about the hypogeum do actually exist in there, and visa records show that she was, in fact, in Malta in the 30s. So that doesn't make her story true, but we do at least know that she was actually there. And this is what she wrote. I visited some friends on the island of Malta in the mid-1930s. One afternoon, six of us decided to hire a car and visit some of the many historical tourist attractions on the island. One of our party suggested that, since the weather is very hot, our best bet was to visit some of the caves and underground temples. There, at least, we could keep cool for a few hours. So, we went to an underground temple known as the Hypogeum of House Selflini and sought out the guide for a tour. 
There was a fairly large cave entrance with ancient mural decorations of whorls and wavy lines, diamond patches here and there, also oval patterns seemingly painted with red ochre. The entrance itself smelt damp and moldy, but inside the cave there was not a trace of mustiness. Joe, the guide, told us that there were three floors of underground rooms and gave us each a lighted candle. One by one, we bent down low to walk through a narrow passage which led to a step or two, and again we were able to stand up in a fair-sized room which had been built out of the Malta sandstone eons ago in the Stone Age. Joe told of a powerful oracle, or wishing well, deep down, and how it had worked wonders in the old days for the initiated who knew the correct sound to use. Interesting that she's talking about sound and vibration back in the 30s. I think the oracle still works today unless it was damaged. Malta was heavily bombarded during World War II. The oracle was supposed to work only if a male voice called to it, but as the guide was saying this, I slipped down a small step and gave a yell that was picked up by something and magnified throughout the whole cave. We followed the guide through some more narrow passages which led down, 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 then straightened our backs again when we came into another room. In this large opening was a circular stone table or altar in the center of the room. Cut out of the rock walls around were layers of stone beds or resting places of some kind, with hollows scooped out for head, body, and narrowing to the feet. I guess these were places for adults about four feet tall with smaller scooped out beds. It looked like mother, father, and child either slept or were buried here, although we saw no bodies here. Down, down, again, stooping and crawling through a narrow passage into another large room with slits or narrow openings in the stone wall. I peered through a slit and saw skeletons. Through another slit, I peered into a cave where the guide said they kept their prisoners. A three-foot-thick stone door about four feet high and four feet wide guarded the entrance. What kind of people and how strong were these pygmies to be able to carve out these rooms to a definite pattern and to move doors this thick and heavy, I thought. This is the end of the tour, Joe the guide said. We must now turn and retrace our steps. What's down there, I asked him, for on turning I noticed another opening off one of the walls. Go in there at your own risk, he replied, and you won't go far. I was all for more exploring and Talking it over with my friends, three of them decided to go with me, and two waited with the guide. I was wearing a long sash around my dress, and since I decided to lead the group, I asked the next one behind me to hold on to it. Holding our half-burnt candles, the four of us ducked into this passage, which was narrower and lower than the others. Groping and laughing our way along, I came out first onto a ledge pathway about two feet wide, with a sheer drop about 50 feet or more on my right and a wall on my left. I took a step forward close to the rock wall side. The person behind me, still holding on to my sash, had not yet emerged from the passage. Thinking that it was quite a drop and perhaps I should go no further, without the guide, I held up my candle. There across the cave, from an opening deep below me, emerged 20 persons of giant stature. In single file, they walked along a narrow ledge. Their height I judged to be about 20 or 25 feet since their heads came about halfway up the opposite wall. They walked very slowly, taking long strides. Then they all stopped, turned and raised their heads in my direction, all simultaneously raised their arms and with their hands beckoned me. The movement was something like snatching or feeling for something, as the palms of their hands were face down. Terror rooted me on the spot, I bet. Go on, we're all getting stuck in the passage, my friend jerked at my sash. What's the matter? Well, there's nothing much to see, I stammered, taking another step forward. My candle was in my right hand. I put my left hand on the wall to steady me and stopped again. My hand wasn't on cold rock, but on something soft and wet. As it moved, a strong gust of wind came from nowhere and blew out my candle. 
Now I really was scared and in the darkness. Go back, I yelled to the others. Go back and guide me back by my sash. My candle's gone out and I can't see. In utter panic, I backed into the narrow little passageway and forced the others back too until we had backed into the large room where Joe and my friends were waiting. What a relief that was. Well, did you see anything? asked one of them. No, I quickly replied. There was a draft in there that blew out my candle. Let's go, said Joe the guide. I looked up at him. Our eyes met. I knew that at one time he had seen what I had seen. There was an expression of caution in his eyes, adding to my reluctance to tell anyone. I decided not to. Out in the open again and in the hot Malta sunshine, we thanked the guide. And he said, if you really are interested in exploring further, it would be wise to join a group. There's a school teacher who is going to take a party exploring soon. I left my address with him and asked him to have the school teacher get in touch with me, but I never heard any more about it until one of my friends called me to read an item from the Valletta paper. I say, Lois, remember that tunnel you wanted to explore? It says here in the paper that a schoolmaster and 30 students went exploring and apparently got as far as we did. They were roped together and the end of the rope was tied to the opening of the cave. As the last student turned the corner where your candle blew out, the rope was clean cut and none of the party was found because the walls caved in. The shock of this information didn't change my determination not to say anything about my experience in the hypogeum. But several months later, my sister visited Malta and insisted on making a tour of the underground temple on House of Fleeny. Reluctantly, I went along, retracing the same route, but there was a different guide this time. When we got down to the lowest level, to the room where I had taken off to explore the tunnel entrance, was boarded up. Wasn't it here that the schoolmaster and 30 students got trapped? I asked the guide. Perhaps, he replied with a noncommittal shrug of the shoulder shoulders and refused to say anything more. You can't get a thing out of the Maltese when they don't want to talk. You are new here, aren't you? I asked him. Where's Joe, the guide who was here a couple months ago? I don't know any Joe, he shook his head. I alone have been showing people around this catacomb for years. So the article that her friend had read and called her about was National Geographic, August of 1940, where a uh, couple guys were taking a bicycle tour across Malta and heard from the locals that years ago one could walk underground from one end of Malta to the other, but all the entrances were closed by the government because of a tragedy, and then he goes on to talk about the missing school children. And the locals say that for weeks, mothers declared that they had heard wailing and screaming from underground. Richard Shavers of Borderland Sciences calls these underground cavern dwellers the Daros and says that they're cannibals and enjoy eating human flesh. And I talked earlier about the various pitfalls and traps that are in there. Well, there were also caverns found just full of like tens of thousands of bones all randomly piled up with no sign of what happened to any of the flesh. Basically, any researcher that's been involved in this all agrees that there's some cannibalism involved here. And really, is this any less freaky if they were just six feet tall instead of 25? But Shaver, talking about the Daros in 1950, said, The interior of your earth is largely hollow. If it became solid, in that moment, what you call your force of gravity would be instantly raised many hundreds of times. You would be mashed to the earth, nor is the earth a great mass of fire inside. There are under the earth places where one can live comfortably, and indeed where he would be relieved of many of his ills. No, he would not find total darkness, for at certain depths there is a light, a diffused glow from rocks and plant life, a kind of phosphorescent light. Do you know where your Christian story of the devil comes from? Many centuries ago, when Atlantis went down, many of her people fled into caves. They stayed down there for many generations. Now, their skin did not turn red like your pictures of the devil, but rather in extreme white and tones of green. This is brought about by the lack of ultraviolet rays of the sun, and the green was due to absorption from minerals below the surface. 
Some of those who went underground morally degenerated, and with the moral degeneration went physical degeneration. Some of them are quite like the Australian Bushmen. There are some races that are quite out of fashion and have been extinct for many thousands of years. You should try to meet some of your fond ancestors. They would look quite badly in a tuxedo or formal evening dress. Well, that went way longer than I expected. What's up, Ruckus? But, like I've said quite a few times now, the one crazy pirate theory I can get behind is that civilizations long ago went underground and to survive some kind of big event, and they might still be down there, and they might happen to be 20 feet tall or so. Now, as to why they would cover this up, I would think because it holds an important key to our past. I mean, why would you go through all of this trouble? I really don't understand the why. I do know that basically all of academia a couple hundred years ago was doing everything they could to discredit anything that's in the Bible. You know, geologists came up with uniformitarianism to disprove the flood. So I see that motive side of things. The one thing I do know is the who. And this used to be all over YouTube. Basically, every truth video talked about the J-suits. And, and now I get shut down if I talk about them. If you don't know who I'm talking about, ask somebody down in the comments section. And then go look up their oath. And you'll know just how dedicated they are to the cause. So, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I do think it's pretty well fact that in North America, these giants still existed 700 years ago and had whole cities. And that the changes, the cycle that happened then, basically wiped all of them out. So, I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I will catch you on the next one. Static out.